your fish room, TV, YouTube, wherever it lives. How's everybody doing today? Um, I hope that everybody's doing well. And uh, yeah, I have some new fish to uh, show you guys, so that should be fun. Uh, but let's see here. Oh, let's see if we can get a better connection to the intranets. All right. Also, Rico Stan, Susan, uh, let's see here. Jenny, hello. Muppet. Chubbs, what's up, John? How's it going, man? Uh, Cichlids Unleashed, what is going on? Uh, Jay Oliver's Guppies and Aquatics, hello. Uh, and John Bon Bon, hello. <laughs> Donnie Wolf, what's up? Uh, let's see here. All right, so, Skipper, what's going on? Welcome, welcome back again. Welcome back, my friends, to the show that never ends. Come inside, come inside. We're going to talk about fish tonight. So, new fish right here. Now, these are new to the world. I have a species profile coming out about them, and also the video will have much better color than a live stream. But I figured this is kind of what sparked today's topic, which is uh, how cichlids are adapting all over the world, essentially. And there's been a lot of new research coming out, a lot of papers. Fish news you can't use. Uh, we'll probably be touching on some of that. Uh, I was going to do fish news today, but I decided to just kind of keep it more open and we'd answer some questions if y'all have any questions. Because I also want to, uh, you know, get to that if anybody needs help with any uh, things going on in their fish room. But right here we have the exciting new species uh, which is uh, Haplochromus uh, in nature <laughs> and <coughs> this is actually from Lake Victoria so I met up with a friend who's by the name of Lawrence Kent and uh, he went to Africa well he's been there like 50 or 70, I don't know, he's been there over 70 times, actually, come to think of it. So, he's been there uh, many, many times, all over the continent. And he collected these fish a few years ago when he went. He caught them in Lake Victoria, threw in a net, and uh, got a female that had a mouthful of babies. So, that those babies are guaranteed, then, to be, you know, the species. They could be a wild hybrid... Uh, that occurs naturally, but they're not going to be, you're not going to catch the wrong female and put the wrong male and female together and then breed them in captivity, which is actually a, an issue. So right now, it's a little hard to see in here. I need, need to think, but I didn't want to clean the tank while they were, you know, here we go. There's eating. Um, didn't want to clean the tank since they're still new to it, but you can see even on a live stream, They've got a beautiful red color to them, the males, with a stripe down the side. Obviously, these are some little rock cribs, uh, sub-adults, and then we've got a albino crib in here, too. But over here, we've got the females, and uh, in here, we've got the alpha male or dominant male, whatever you want to call him. He's the most red and colorful, and he's down two and a half feet uh, in the tank. But what I did is I cleared out, uh, so there's gravel and sand in there for them, cleared out a little area, and then I made a lean-to out of rocks and kind of made a little den for them in there. And there's kind of this similar thing going on with this big rock back here by the inlet flow pipe here. So um, there's one male that has got one female that seems to be his little buddy or pair maybe uh, that's hanging out here, and here's that female. And she actually has her ovipositor out, uh, and it's only been uh, not even 48 hours that they've been here. She's got it out. So, wow, thank you so much, Misfits. Uh, Misfits uh, Reptiles and Aquatics, $20 super chat. That is extremely helpful. Thank you. Um, as you rec If you recall, I had Sergio in this tank, the angelfish, and um, I had to, uh, well, he jumped out and he passed away. And so I've basically got most everything out of the tank uh, other than 
a few of the um, a few of the uh, odds and ends in here are these uh, Corridoras. They're um, still in here, and they're actually I'm happy they're in here because they're kind of the cleanup crew for anything that gets missed by. Um, by the uh, bigger boys and then we've also got the the normal cribs in here the rock cribs and the um they were once called tiniatus but they're pelvica chromis and then go, they go by their collection points so this would be a nigerian red but it's actually an albino nigerian red uh, male that's fully grown in here now there is slight chance that like they could maybe cross or something since we don't know for sure about this wild haplochrome miss species um, but it's highly unlikely and the size difference is substantial so I'm not worried about it um, but definitely you know I appreciate that that super chat and I appreciate all you guys that are doing channel memberships and things like that um, it, it really helps a lot especially uh, with these guys they're gonna have a big food bill to keep them uh, fat and sassy these guys are definitely um, I got them when I got them from Lawrence the other day he lives in Seattle and when he's not traveling the world which is literally like every other week uh, he is in town and uh, at his uh, fish room his fish lab here and uh, he's basically got a collection of just the coolest fish that he has collected from uh, his travels all over the world but again like I said he's been to Africa many times and uh, for work he's works for the Gates Foundation and so he's done a lot of work with um, I guess charities and things there um, the other thing to note is that I did have some reed tetras in here there were like three that I couldn't catch and then a glow light tetra those have all since um, disappeared I all say however <laughs> I'm pretty sure that they didn't disappear they're just in the belly of one of these uh, illustrious little fish so here's the the alpha female if you want to call her that she's got a really nice olive green color um, and again like I said you lose the color as once you get to about here in the tank you start losing the reds and things on the fish just because light you lose every six inches or so you lose about 50 percent of your um, lum luminosity um, going down into the water and so things start to look more um, sedated and, and blue light rit uh, riddled but these little fish um, like I said caught in a net from a dugout canoe a little boat and uh, then gra the mouth of one of these females like like just like one of these grabbed and um, squeezed and the babies came out and then were brought home to the United States. Also, uh, there's a few other collection points he uh, visited on the same trip. And so if you heard from me early on, there's a chance that I may have said that this was uh, the one from, or if you, you're a channel member, I may have said that these are the ones uh, from over by Lake Kivu. Um, but those were, those are a separate fish. These are another one from the same trip though uh from the lake proper from this bay um and actually in the article where he wrote published he published the article about catching these he said there were a whole bunch of local ugandans listening to hip-hop music uh with like speakers like a sound system set up and uh just chilling on the beach and so when they came in to collect you know they weren't sure if they were going to find anything because of all the noise and stuff but sure enough there was uh there was this fish and then two others that um are in an article that he published that hopefully i can link to it's i think it's behind a paywall but he sent me a copy so there's got to be a way to to share a pdf or at least some pictures of it as long as he okays that uh with the members but in any case, yeah, the fish are, here's that uh, subdominant male the with the red. They've got these three copper eye spots on their anal fin that's really, really reflective and metallic. And then when they eat, they just glow. Like, you see the belly of these cribs? They're fully colored right now, so it kind of gives you an idea of, uh, if you know cribs, that it's a little dim down this deep in the water. 
uh, the coloration, but um, when they're up at the top, I got some pictures today again too, and some video where you can really see the reds and blues and greens and yellows. I mean, they got they've got rainbow colors on them. So pretty interesting fish. Um, they would be impacted then, unlike some other varieties uh, of of fish. Now, the 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 main problem for a lot of these fish is they've been uh, put under heavy pressure by the impact of of um, in in both uh, Lake Victoria, Lake. Um, what other lakes? Uh, Lake Tanganyika and uh, Lake Malawi. They have put in uh, tilapia, which are a big, big fish, uh, Nile perch, and they have had um, a really devastating impact on the the fish that live there naturally. Um, they have just eaten a lot of the fish, which is one thing, but they've also um, destroyed some of their shallow water habitats gone in and kind of scoured out what they eat and where they nest here is another central african cichlid now this is the nanochromus parlous and uh he's uh just chilling hanging out there the female's probably back in another corner um but they're another one that is they're not so much impacted um since these are in the congo river uh, as well as uh, the Niger River, and they're kind of found more in um, uh, Central African Republic and like the Luanda River and uh, things like that. These guys have really made a home in this little cave. They seem to like it, um, and they colored up and were doing spawning motions and then just kind of ease off on it. So I don't know what's going to happen. This is kind of a weird selection of a tank because we've got the half beaks and then we've got all the aspidoras from uh, Aquatic Arts sent me. And then we've got the, uh, the nanochromis. Then the other cool new thing I have to share with you other than a giant uh, mystery snail is, look at this. These are new rams and uh, see if we can get a shot. Again, the color is just atrocious compared to how they really look. Uh, these guys are rainbow. And of all places, where do you guys think I found these? And I had to, I had to get them. I was buying fish food and dechlorinator. And I ran into these for $6.99 each. And they are balloon rams. However, they had a couple adults. And uh, they didn't look too balloony. Like, they, they didn't look too stunted and pushed up because I really don't like most balloon varieties of fish um, but yet you know being a little cichlid a South American cichlid I figured I'd show you guys these today too uh, maybe he'll come next to the glass a little bit I'm hoping that this is a male it looks like he had a black spot with no uh, margin no blue in the margin but we'll see and then uh, the female, uh, or what I hope is a female, kind of looks more like your traditional electric blue um, ram, blue German ram, or powder blue German ram. She's, uh, we caught a glimpse of her a moment ago, but she's probably, oh, there she is right there. So um, she doesn't have any bands or dark dots or anything. She's just pretty much an electric blue. Um, let's see if we can make out that color a little better from this angle, perhaps. Um, but yeah, so just really cool fish. I know that's a lot of glare and you guys probably are like, Alex, that's lame. Why are you showing us glare? But, uh, I just thought I'd try to give you a sneak peek of those because I don't know. We'll see. Uh, I just, you know, I felt like I, I moved the, the crib pair that was in here, the albino and the rock crib. Uh, and I just moved them over with the other Africans and then made way for this uh, set of uh, South Americans. So it looks like she's coming right up to the glass to check out the camera uh, and the gimbal. She's really friendly. And they're um, obviously a domestic strain uh, made by fish keepers. And uh, 
hopefully, yeah, I'm hoping this is a female. Um, the, the dorsal fin, hard to tell for sure, but it looks like um, there's some black uh, lines uh, on the first few rays, but they're not taller than the, the, the apex of her dorsal fin. So I'm hoping that she's an actual female and not a male, but who knows, they're still young yet. Uh, it could be two, two males or two females, don't know. Maybe you guys might have a better idea than me if you've kept these specific rams. Um, good to see everyone coming in. Uh, how is everybody doing? Uh, and uh, let's see here. Uh, Donnie says, I've never kept a single cichlid. What makes them different compared to regular aquarium fish like a tetra besides aggressiveness? Well, actually, it's it's kind of a myth or, or um, a misconception that they're mean automatically, that cichlids are mean. You know, what cichlids are is they, they almost across the board take care of their young. And so the fact that they take care of their young makes it that they are protective of their young and so they establish areas they establish little zones so like if this tank had a cichlid you'd probably find one in here somewhere in the rocks maybe one back in there and one over there um so you need to just give them enough space for that uh and it's different with different cichlids in here we've got golden um um we've got golden dwarf cichlids and uh, they're another South American, and they're doing their thing too, just fine. But they're um, they're cave dwellers, and so they're literally always in their little huts. Uh, unfortunately, separately, because uh, they spawned once for me right when I first got them, and then they haven't sp spawned again. Um, thanks again, by the way. A lot of these fish are from Aquatic Arts or the Wet Spot, and Aquatic Arts, of course, I work with them frequently. Uh, they send me things to try out, and also, um, if you guys really want some fish in particular, um, I have a little bit of sway in being able to order them, uh, or, or try to get them to buy something. Same with, um, group buys. So if we want to do a group buy and get a hold of some, uh, something in particular, we can do that. Uh, the other thing that's interesting, just thought I'd mention it real quick, is that my, um, crips are reaching to, uh, possibly flower, um, so we'll see what happens, but, um, Lucens and Lutea, um, between the two of them, uh, are all in this, this fish room, all trying to flower. Then we've also got, um, Apistos in here, which are another, uh, South American, uh, cichlid. And if we poke around in here, we'll probably find them. Um, they also live in little huts, but the, um... Whoops, there goes that. Hold on, let's try to grab it without disturbing everyone in the tank. So let me grab a net. But the the main thing that we're finding with cichlids across the world is that they evolve for very, very specific niches. So this fish down here, the Haplochromus, you know, they evolved to live in rocky areas at the bottom of the lake. Uh, not not necessarily super deep, but I mean, they could be found uh, up to 75 meters they've been found down in the lake and all the way as shallow as shore too. But um, they have that ability and they have the ability to um, eat with their mouth the way it is. They can kind of scrape rocks a little bit and they have uh, the mouth where the jaw gesticulates forward and they can make a suction with it like a bass. So they're able to also eat insects or worms and kind of pull them out of holes and, and burrows and things like that. Uh, here's that big male. He's, he's shy from me still. Um, but that allows them also to eat things out of logs and things like that. And they've evolved. Literally, they think there were two, if not maybe three species in all of Lake uh, Tanganyika, uh, Victoria, and Malawi. And uh, they all evolved from those, uh, you know, ancestral fish and then diverged. So it's a really fascinating, um, really fascinating biology, I guess, lesson or example in that they were able to do so much speciation in one lake. You know, they're giant lakes. Lake Victoria is, 
uh, the biggest lake by area in the world. Uh, I think Lake Bikal has a beat in volume, but that's it, um, and depth, obviously. Um, but each bay within the lake has different fish. So Lawrence also collected, when he caught these, he caught fish that were um, haplochromous, that had uh, vertical and horizontal stripes that looked pretty much the same in coloration otherwise, except for that was a difference. Um, and they were grouped together. It was hard to tell the females apart whatsoever, and so that's why it's important that he collected them by grabbing a female with fry already in her mouth. So what these fish do, the haplochromis or uh, enterochromis, uh, that's with an E, not an I, enter, enterochromis, um, which is kind of the name for the group of uh, I don't know, 20 or 30 fish that don't have names right now uh, that could be their own species, they could be a new species, or they could um, be an amalgam and just a variety, just like you have, uh, you know, different guppies, but they're the same species. Uh, or there could be some hybridization going on. We, we don't know for sure yet. It's being sorted out as we speak. Uh, but the difference with the stripes for instance I have a paper that I was just reading and it found that the cichlids with the uh, horizontal stripes the haplochromis tended to hang out near grassy areas and areas with um, growth near the bank of the lake uh, whereas the ones with the horizontal line or linear um, line down their lateral line uh, shadowing their lateral line uh, they tended to be in more open water and then down, uh, down in between the rocks in, where there isn't as much plant material. So that's very similar to, say, like a zebra. Uh, the zebras, they live in the grasslands, and so they have that, that look to them. You know, and then there's certain traits like the dots on the tail, the leopard print dots, you can tell the difference between an ornamental decor decoration like this one. See all the dots on that crib there? That's going to be a decorative thing most likely um, when they get those patterns because the if they just have those spots or eye spots as they're called sometimes, it's, it's uh, usually for spawning or mating and it shows that they're healthy, that they've consume something in their environment that is responsible for the, the vividness of the contrast in that tail. Um, whereas if they only have an eye spot, like one, then you might figure that that is an adaptation for predation. So that, that means they have something was hunting them in the water and they use that as a false um, eye almost so that that predators can't tell which end of the fish is which and hopefully they'll bite for that tail and the fish can dart out of the way uh, and not bite for the head which uh, it's considerably harder to run away without a head than without a tail um, here is the the uh, panda uh, panda epistogramma panda or pandarini panduro uh, and this is the female, bright canary yellow with the cool little mask and the eye black uh, kind of coloration. And then uh, the male is completely different, which is another thing that's very common in, um, in cichlids in general, is the male and female tend, not in every species, but tend to be very different, with the male usually being brighter. However, that's not always the case. Sometimes the female is brighter and um, is more showy, and that is the case like in my Nanochromis uh, transvestitis. Those ones are, are given that name because uh, transvestitis indicates that, they, uh, that the males have female characteristics, is what the name is getting at in Greek, which, which is that the females are far more colorful. So you may not think of certain things as cichlids that are. Epistos, those are uh, very clearly a cichlid. Um, obviously, you've got your big cichlids, your green terrors, your red devils, your um, mabunu, um, and uh, your imboise, and all your big African 
groups of them. Then you've got little teeny ones like checkerboard cichlids or, um, you know, the other one that people forget is a cichlid all the time is the angelfish. So the angelfish, all three species, the Leopold, uh, Leopoldi, the Altum, and the Scalara, this being a Scalara, um, are all also cichlids. So they're another one. The Cribenzis, obviously, are cichlids. Um, it looks like we got another super chat rolling in here. Let's see here. So let's see. Where did I? Where did it go? Do do do. And also, I have something to tell you. Uh, Regina, can I add substrate to a seasoned rainbow fish tank without removing my fish? Can I put sand over plant-specific substrate? Um, yes, you can add sand over anything at any time. Uh, you could choke out some plants if they're like a carpeting plant and you have CO2 or something, but unless you have like dwarf hair grass or something that's really short or glossostigma um, or Monte Carlo, something like that, you're really not gonna probably drown it out with the baby tears or anything. Okay, so I don't want these guys, the balloon rams, these are German blue rams or Bolivian rams, Colombian rams, uh, you might have heard them called. Uh, and these are also a cichlid. Now these ones are kind of perfectly round. They almost look like a little discus at this age, with this stage, with how round they are, which kind of drew my attention. That and the price and the fact that I figured they just die at, at PetSmart. But I'm hoping that this is a female and that that is the male. Um, but yet again, um, I should put them in a better tank with better coloration. It's just this one actually has black worms in the substrate, which they like to eat. And then it also has... Um, three caves for them and some random uh dither fish in there like um some sparkling garamis that actually hatched in there that i'd hatched out in there uh so we'll hop and look at a couple more cichlids and we'll keep talking about cichlid studying but um also to mention if you're switching out the substrate if you're using an active substrate like ada amazonia or um, even like fluval stratum and things like that, usually that won't cause a problem. There's nothing in it that is going to cause ammonia, nitrogen, nitrate, and nitrite spikes. But um, sometimes it can uh, just make the water cloudy, make the TDS kind of go wonky. So I always recommend um, if you're doing any of those kind of soil clay based substrates to just kind of do it gradually, do a little bit each day um, and also rinse things properly. But sand in it on its own, um, the properties it has, uh, it's not going to cause any harm. You can add an inch or two of it on top of any sort of live substrate or active substrate. And the only thing it may do is cut down on the oxygenation in the in the roots. So you just want to make sure that you've got plants that already have roots established or just make sure you tuck those roots down in so that they can sense the nutrients down below. And that's also a good place to put root tabs and whatnot. So um, Rob93, what's going on? Good to see you too. A collaboration of curiosities, what's going on? Um, let's see here. Yeah, for sure, um, Misfits says, just picked up some purple harlequin rasbora from Aquatic Arts. Save 15 bucks using the code. Right on. Glad that the code helps. So if you guys want to use the discount code, I'll always have it up to date on my most recent videos. Uh, so just check my most recent video and it'll always be in the description for you. Uh, so coming back around, coming back around again uh let's see here we've got cichlids in here too and i just don't know if they're going to come out we've got two nanochroma species in here uh that are very peaceful uh they never bother nobody uh and they're pretty shy though there's one right there uh hanging out and you guys have seen my videos on them probably or just seen my updates on them also um there we go. There, there they are. These are very similar to Cribenzis, but they're very long, and they live in rivers. Uh, long-bodied and very colorful. Um, this, these ones happen to be kind of blue, purple, pink, and uh, 
and a peach color. And actually, my little uh, one of my um, leopard frog plecos happens to be out too. Kind of interesting. And the uh, there's another one of the the other species, the um, parlous, right there uh, of the nanochromus. Now this is as big as these get. They only get about three or four inches max, which means you can keep them in a twenty long, a pair of them or a trio of them. And um, sometimes they don't even get that big. So these are, you know, a very peaceful fish uh, that's, that's very easy to keep. They're in with little young guppies and they're in with baby um, Corydoras and never have caused any problem whatsoever. In fact, the Garamis, my wife's fish, uh, cause more problems uh, attacking anyone than any of the cichlids do. There you can see some of the coloration with that yellow tail and um, some of those the really pretty metallic uh, markings and the big yellow eye. So new paper, uh, back to cichlid science. This is one of the new papers that came out is cichlids in Africa correlates to the fact that they were once a nocturnal or at least uh, partially nocturnal because... Now they're finding that with um, with the cichlids, it's not just nocturnal or diurnal, um, or uh, or both for that matter. I'm going to skip to the bottom on the chat here, folks. Um, but they are are finding that it's uh, actually that some of them sleep one hour and then they're awake one hour and then they're asleep one hour and then they're awake one hour and they do that all day or some sleep for two hours and then they're awake for three or some sleep starting at noon and wake up at 6 p.m. you know like there's all sorts of different sleep schedules in the different species and because of this they've adapted different sizes uh, of of um eyeballs over the years and then even though they may not use them still then they've been able to kind of spread back out um and unfortunately in in the rift lakes it's because they're under threat um the nile perch or um blue tilapia um are responsible for eating a lot of the the fish and uh hunting the babies and ruining the nesting grounds uh, and so that makes it so that uh, there's new niches opening. So they're finding all sorts of fish, like the ones in the other room, the haplochromus, are taking up niches that were once held by other species that are now extinct. They don't know how many for sure yet, but there are a lot. Now, the other thing about this tank here, we've got some of the Beckford eye pencil fish. You can see this female with the gold color on her. She's got a big old belly because I've been feeding them live of sex from out and the males all sleek in champagne or bronze colored pinkish champagne color uh so we've definitely got one female that's just wants to spawn like none other um i'm trying to show you guys the transvestitis um cichlid here let's see if we can kind of coax them towards the front we've also got sparkling garamis in here um, obviously this is the tank that's got CO2 in it. It's also got Pleco babies growing out in it. Um, so it's a bit of a jungle in here. Um, and then here, here's a nice little surprise. We've got a little anchor catfish. Aquatic Arts has these and a banjo cats, last I checked, on sale right now. But they're really interesting. These ones can withstand cooler water, and, uh, they're from India. And, uh... Uh, they're just an interesting, weird little fish. Super teeny. They only get about half an inch long, uh, and that's it. Like that's their full, that's their full aptitude. Um, now let's see here. Um, they've got to be hiding then, either right in the center here, or, yep, they are. I see one. Um, or they're back in the corner. But I see one of the transvestitis. And she's going to go in the rocks, of course, even though I tried to get a pair. Um, and so hopefully we have a pair, but I don't know for sure. Um, I had to trust the wet spot. I was down there in Portland uh, visiting 
uh, Kenny and Danny of Danakin Aquatics, um, I was able to go to the wet spot and get some fish and things, but um, it's kind of like take a number and wait system going on there since it's always so busy. Um, we can try though real quick to, to lift up this stone and see if we can see the female in here. Oh, she swam out immediately, didn't she? Yeah. So in here, if you recall, I built this. This is a cave. So for those of you who are curious where that little hidden cave was, um, well, that's where it was uh, or is. It's back in there, and that is so that I can keep either cichlids or any cave dwellings, cheese of gudgeon or anything else like that um, in this tank. And also uh, that then aerates where the substrate is super dense. Um, the other stone catfish is actually right up against the wall here, and you can't even see him. He's blended in so well. You can see his body. That's it right there, right there. Um, but, yeah, so I guess we're not going to see the transvestitis, uh, nanochromus transvestitis right now, um, which is a bummer because they are a beautiful fish. Um, I was really hoping that we could kind of coax one out um so far they've been extremely shy which seems to be uh true with a lot of the nanochromis um now that i have three species of nanochromis here and i've kept four in my life um they all seem to be very shy until they reach their full size um so well we'll just have to see if they decide to come out later uh i fed them already last night to try to get them out to take pictures uh, but they're a very pretty fish you can look up um, nanochromis transvestitis um, and they're they're uh, they're a pretty one see here's a a better shot of the uh, other nanochromis the transvestitis have um, black lines kind of like these little pencil fish do all up and down their bodies so there's those, um, and, you know, we even have a cichlid in the United States. In fact, here is the transvestitis right now. Stressed because I've been chasing it around, um, so you're not really going to make out a great color on it. Um, but there's blues, the top fin's got like a yellow color, and then um, right now it just looks really drab because of the stress of me poking around in the tank but they really like planted tanks whereas some cichlids you don't even have the op plants in with the cichlids because they'll eat them immediately um do we have any other questions i know i may have skipped over some uh if you have a question say at alex this room is a mess i need to clean it like last week um, the other cool fish that was in here that I just wanted to mention to see if it was out are these little um, bumblebee yellow, sometimes they're called bumblebee orange, um, Burmese glass catfish. Uh, and also, my Borneo loach is out. Uh, Borneo striped hillstream loach. Jerry, how's it going, buddy? I hope you're doing well. Um, but yeah, they're all looking good there with the birdsong goby, um, named after Ray Birdsong, a collector. Also, all the, um, aquatic arts, um, Pseudomagill luminatus have just taken on a beautiful color. They're just growing and they're looking great. And again, there goes the little catfish. Um, hopefully we can intercept it on the other side. And then, uh, did the rams come back around again? Or did the other cichlids come out? And then we've also got um, more. Well, we're, we'll wait here for just a moment. But we've also got all the garamis here. Um, these are the um, samurai. Or sometimes they're called ninja. Sometimes they're called rainbow garamis. Um, sometimes they're called valentino garamis. But they're similar to chocolate garamis. And uh, right now I'm treating them because their tails were clamped and they had some white stuff that looked kind of like ick. So I turned up the temperature to 85 and so far it paused all the development of the ick in its tracks. Also, I'm going to be putting in some little tubes in here soon for the panda loaches. 
uh, in with the blue, all the blue shrimp. Uh, the panda loaches, hopefully this summer we'll get a spawn in, out of them. That's usually when they, they give it a go. Um, so we'll see. Don't know, but we'll see. Um, I would say, oh wait, and there's the, the rams. Again, they're just shy, so they're afraid of me and my phone and the gimbal. They don't like the gimbal. Um, but, uh, let's see here. Can you talk a bit about the transitioning Madaka from a tank to an outdoor patio pond? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know what? I can actually show you what that looks like. So, um, where did I put, I had a, a white net. Where did the white net go? Oh, it's, duh. It's right where I need it. So up here we've got some Madaka. Um, there's an orange one in here somewhere. Uh, a Yoiki or Yo Yohiki. Yuhiki. Uh, I don't, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. So I apologize to our Japanese viewers, of which I think there are none right now. So not too worried about uh, butchering that. But in any case, oh, there it is. So, come on. I'm gonna catch you. You're a quick one. Boom. Quick. Quick in the cot. Alright. So, it's a really complex process. Um, who asked about that? Randy. Um, Randy, it's a really complex process. So, what you do is you want to get them in a net. And then you want to make sure you've got some CO2 handy. And um, some nitrous oxide, like laughing gas. And then you want to make sure that you have um, a large dither fish, like, um, like a piranha. And you want to set that piranha up in a tank and get it all comfortable and happy. I mean, that tank that we were just in, it was probably about 70. Oh, wait, you know what? I'm going to need to turn off my Wi-Fi here. What's going on? Come on. What is happening? Uh, uh, that tank all ready to go. And you get whatever your favorite fish are. Then you take the fish that you put in the net and totally forgot about because it's been out of water for like, I don't know, 20 minutes. And you just flick it in there and it'll pretend like it's dead for a second until you show it that it's not and then it'll be fine and that's that uh the temperature difference here today it's about 65 out and inside it was probably about ooh, i don't know the t their tank was probably 78 which is a little hot for them anyways but yeah no it's really simple you can kind of shock rice fish um i mean they can live under ice so the difference of going to 80 to 60 not that big of a deal honestly um got we got a lawnmower by the way so we got that taken care of finally um and then also here's the other tub right now i need to get the other tubs going by the way but here we have um more rice fish these are the pearl scales and also these are the um the uh um Gambusia. So there's a Gambusia right over here. And uh, no babies yet. Kind of need 70 degree water for rice fish or even guppies and things to really start producing. 68 for Gambusia. But yeah, so you really just need that that warmer water um, to, to get them to produce. Um, by the way, I think you guys let me know what you think about this new time on Wednesdays. I think this is where we're going to be. Um, and then we'll have our longer episodes on the weekend if need be. But um, yeah, boy, I need to clean this room. It's bugging me. Um, yeah. So also all my little, uh, all the lovely gobies I have from Aquatic Arts are all doing really, really well. Look at, they're having a little conference. One, two, three, four, five six seven eight of them on one rock um all hanging out and then there's some others that are just i don't know confused maybe 
But yeah, I'll move these other rice fish um, soon. And then I have more babies. The babies, I literally moved the babies in April and I didn't acclimate them. Um, what you could do if it's, if it's more than a 15 or 20 degree change, there is a chance at any degree temperature change that you could shock your fish, especially if other things are changing like the TDS and the um, pH and stuff are all changing. If you don't know what, if that's gonna change or how much, then I would actually maybe say take, take a cup of tank water half full with the fish you want and then take another cup, scoop out of the pond and then just pour that cold water uh, from your your pond outside into that cup and let it sit for like 20 or 30 minutes and then um, Put the whole thing in the pond and let it float at the rim and then just tip it over so um, So yeah, yeah, we have a whole lot. Thanks Mary. Yeah, we have a lot of projects on hand um, and uh, Alishon thanks. I, I'm glad you liked the time too. Yeah goldfish can live under ice for sure I have a video on how fish live under ice and what's going on chemically as well as uh with the physics and the chemistry of the water um and and biology of the fish for that matter oh also i have a couple of praycox rainbow fish in here they are generally a fairly peaceful fish but i put them in with pea puffers as an experiment because these ones are about middle age and poopy apparently i gave them blood worms this afternoon um but they seem to be getting along like it seems like they both have enough attitude that you um that, that they're gonna hold, each hold their own kind of equally so that's that alleviates some of my worries uh that i had um but yeah so the other cool thing about going on right now about cichlids is they're finally able to do dna um tracking uh of the speciation before we used a lot on um before we used a lot of the jaw the dentition their, you know, their teeth uh, and the um, bones, which are actually cartilage in a lot of fish. Um, so it's not the most accurate thing either when I just told you that in 1975, they introduced Nile um, perch or tilapia into the Rift Lakes. Um, some, some of it happened earlier, but there was a concerted effort to stop droughts and famines. Um, so they built dams and they put in a bunch of uh, food fish from Africa, from other parts of Africa, into the beautiful ecosystem that was the Rift Lakes. And while that's still a great food source uh, for the people, uh, it it just destroyed the most um, ecologically diverse lakes in the world. Lake Sulawesi is probably maybe it, it's probably the only one that I know of that may have them beat um, for diversity for size. Uh, Lake Baikal is pretty diverse too, they're finding, but a lot of that's really deep, um, and cold water and small, like, cephalopods and things like that. Don't be scared. So the males on these ones are really easy to tell, which is nice. Um, these nanochromis, the males, um, on their tail, instead of it being clear at the bottom, it's red. It's got red lines, like little zigzags on it. So this is a female, and she has nice eyeliner too. She's got like mascara. Oh, there comes the male. He's on the hunt. Um, the problem is though, they both look like they're full of eggs when they eat, so that doesn't really help you at all. <laughs> um, also, speaking of the aquascape, um, uh, the aquascape contest that we'll be hosting soon, the form is ready. The grading rubric is ready. Um, Alan set it all up for me because he's smart and I'm a dumb dumb. And uh, you guys should be thinking about what you want to do. I mean, if you want to do seriously a rubber made like I have outside, that's fine. You just need an immersed growth element and a plan. And we just want to see your um, your your. Uh, your planning, your idea and execution, and then how it looks um, with immersed growth. We need immersed growth. So 
see this little bit of immersed growth? That's not enough to count as immersed growth for the whole tank. But here I'm already starting to try to see which ones I wanna grow. So I'm growing everything up and out right now with some CO2. This is a new plant to me. I've never kept this. It's called Tonina and um, got that about a month ago. So we'll see. We'll see what it does. It's underwater. It's very different. It, it looks much different. I see it there. Than the form that's um, like used to being out of water. Like it just for some reason this one stayed in its current form and this one didn't. And then we've got Rotala Wallachia, which is also pretty similar. Um, but again, the difference is pretty clear. You've actually got like, it looks like little plants stacked within each other. But I'm really wanting to get a hold of some uh, Limnophilia um, Hippodroids and um, some uh, Ludwigia Pantanal, some uh, Crip Nuri, and some Crip, uh, what's the other Crypt I wanted to get? Um, Oh, I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, it's a pink one, Albeda. So those those are also some plants I'd really like to get my hands on that have been really hard to find. Um, can we, yeah, you, um, can you enter more than one tank? Um, I don't know. I'll have to talk to Alan um, about that. The thing is, you can, like I said, you can have an existing tank. Um, I don't think I have a problem with entering like two tanks. You can definitely share your tanks uh, with us. Like, if you've been doing work in, like, aquascaping or doing a biotope tank or something, this one I'm slowly transitioning to an African biotope. So, um, right now there's Italian corkscrew val in here, uh, but there's African bulbitis. There is um, Anubius. There's still a few pieces of boost in there, and then there's also... Um, moss that's uh, an african moss also but there's a few kabamba too so the kabamba needs to go the val i don't know we'll have to look into that if there's a close enough val then i'll probably just say it's okay because i like the coverage it provides and then there's some aponagetans or aponjaton depending on how you want to say it um in there come on buddy come out you should say hi for the end of the stream he's got the blue lips um oh alan says um okay that's great alan i like that rule a lot um so alan says let's say you can enter as many tanks as you wish but you can you can't place in the competition with more than one i think that's totally fair so you can only win a prize for one of them um you can, you can have them all graded and looked at but if two win uh we're gonna knock one out um with the lower score and let someone else get it so that way we have the um, the prize of the signed uh, copies of those amazing books that Alan got a hold of, and then we've got the uh, the cash incentive or or I should say gift card incentive of um, the 250 bucks for the winner, 100 bucks for the second place, and 50 bucks for third place to Aquatic Arts. These cappuccino snails have gotten huge. They're like three, four inches long now. I didn't know they were going to get that big, and I don't know how to feel about it yet. Um, yeah. Also, I'm still really torn about the fact that I'm keeping balloon rams. I really don't like how they've been bred intentionally, so I feel like I'm, like, encouraging the process, but it was, like, a spur-of-the-moment buy in that, like, there were dead ones in the tank, and, like, I really wanted to make sure that um, these lived. They were just too pretty and too cute, so I just wanted to uh, make sure that they got saved. Um, let's see here. What else is being said? Um, Alex, they're doing a major dam on the Blue Nile. Yes, uh, Ethiopia wants to control it pretty hardcore. Um, there are major, major political consequences to who controls the flow of the Blue Nile, the White Nile, and of course the Nile. But if you can control the Blue or the White Nile, then you eff effectively control the actual Nile to a large degree. And right now there's already the Aswan Dam in Egypt. So Egypt already can control its waters within its own country and... Um, I mean, things that they can do 
you would think that because the dam is within the country, so like, um, you would think that the damage, the damage to be done would be like preventing water going downstream. Because obviously if Ethiopia has the dam and they decide to make a big lake and use the reservoir and not let water through, then that's a huge problem for the people downstream who relied on it for um, survival and for crops and drinking water or fish for fishing. But also they can slow the rate of that water release they can back up the water. So like they could back up the whole river and that slows down things and then sediment builds and then nitrites can build because it's soaked farmland or industrial areas, spots that used to be cities and things like that get sunk underwater um, for these projects. So it's not uncommon to see that happen. And it's, um, it's, I mean, they actually flooded temples incredible temples um down uh was it luxor in memphis i think uh in egypt uh yes memphis tennessee is named after an ancient egyptian city uh but just um yeah there's a lot of implications china's also working on another set of big dams right now not nothing like the three gorges but um It'll have an impact down in uh, one in Tibet, the Tibetan area and Nepal, and another in um, the uh, um, southern provinces uh, and down into Myanmar. And then uh, we also have dams on, on the Zingu River, um, which is just all sorts of problems. Also the uh, Wa River, which is... Um, so there's the Irrawaddy and the Wa and the, um, uh, in is it the Inga? Also are big rivers in, um, what do you call, uh, in Myanmar. And, uh, they're not big dams. In fact, they're very small rivers compared to, say, the, um, the Mississippi or even the Columbia River here in Seattle. But they are very crucial to transportation of people. I mean, just the fact that these rivers people don't realize it but before cars in a lot of these cultures um people the lifeblood of a city or of a culture is the river uh or the ocean and boats i mean you can't carry stone monoliths or grain or alcohol or fuel or whatever it may be um you can't carry it over land pre-automobiles or pre-train and so most cultures obviously built their um, big cities on coasts or on river deltas and um, you may not think about it but you know little places like York in um, in England or Newcastle or um, Paris for instance those are cities that were linked internationally with the world because of their rivers so if the river was I think it was eight feet deep and uh, 20 feet wide is all it took. And in as far back as Greek, Roman, even earlier times, people were dredging rivers. Um, they would make that clearable. And so there are all sorts of places all over Southeast Asia and the Amazon that they wait for the rainy seasons. And not only do the fish depend on it, but the people depend on it. And so damming it up, yes, it brings electricity to the region, but uh, a lot of the things that they'd want to do with that electricity, one, their area is flooded, so there's no point. Um, or two, the electricity is controlled by these, um, in many cases, international power companies. At least in Africa, um, it looks like China is really trying to make um, a move to control the hydroelectric stuff going on but now it appears that they're going to nationalize it in so like the ethiopian government would own it or um something along those lines although right now clearly that's not good because they have a civil uprising so you know it's very common to in world history that they would cut off those water sources unfortunately um to those people. So in Ethiopia, if they're having a problem in the Ogaden Desert, which hardly has any water, they literally just cut off the electricity and the um, the uh, 
the flow of irrigation to them and those people are dead. Uh, they're already living on food aid, a lot of them. So in any case, dams, yes, are incredibly destructive in many ways. They're also incredibly powerful in transforming areas like Eastern Washington. There would be nothing in Eastern Washington, the state I live in, um, other than along the Columbia River, if it weren't for the Grand Coulee Dam. When it was built, it was the most concrete in one project ever used. Um, it, it was the biggest man-made structure also in the 19, early 1930s, uh, other than the Panama Canal. Um, and then the Erie Canal might be in there too. But for some reason, the Suez, it used less concrete than the total uh, Coulee project. So I don't know. But maybe they used something else. Maybe it was enough stone that they just chiseled it. Uh, but they're also talking the other crazy thing that could really, really impact Central American cichlids is they're talking China has bought land and surveyed uh, in, I believe, Nicaragua. They are wanting to build a second canal to link the Pacific and the Atlantic Oceans. So they want, a, a, even though they expanded the Panama Canal recently for super tankers, that's the class of them, of oil and cargo container ships that China has these... Uh, I don't know what they're called, Goliath super tankers, I think they're called, or Herculean. They have some name like that, that for their size. But um, they want to do that in uh, in um, Nicaragua. <laughs> but there's a bunch of lakes, and they think, oh, it'll be easy because we'll just use the lakes, and that's already water. We won't have to dig a canal but it'll be punching salt water through or whatever. Um, it'll be punching through a bunch of stuff onto those lakes and just totally wrecking the ecosystem. So um, something to keep an eye on. Uh, let's see here. I guess I'm gonna get out of here soon because I don't want to stomp on Dan's show because Dan's the man with the plan that I like. Um, let's see here. Uh, also a note about dams, the Elwha River in Washington State, I was part of a group of uh, annoying hippies that uh, petitioned and worked on for years. Worked on it from the time I was 17 as when I started getting interested in the idea and then by the time I was about 30 uh, they finally took out the dam at the Elwha River and now whatever five years later um, the Elwha River has salmon back in it, which it, it this, the run had ceased to be. So it's really incredible that that, that quickly, uh, salmonid, salmonoids, um, cichlids, these fish, I mean, they've gone through glacial, glacial periods. They've gone through ice ages. As long as something doesn't completely decimate them, it's incredible how, how adaptable they are. It's just really awesome. Um, all right, you guys, uh, I'm going to bounce like a rabbit and I'll have a video coming out about those uh, new cichlids that I'm keeping and what I'm doing with them what research I want to research uh, if their babies are getting quicker to escape predation just like we talked about in some of my recent videos about fast motion starting um, how guppies and killifish are able to uh, rice fish to lots of fish are able to do a kink in their tail and then release that energy and fling off and get away really fast. Well, the more predation that they're under, especially with invasive species, the longer that tail gets and the bigger the muscles get and the later in life they have babies. So it's a trade-off um, to develop that muscle and put the energy towards that and not color or being able to carry um, eggs, but then it allows them to escape early predation. So seeing at what point they put all their energy towards escaping predation is another interesting point. Or if they decide, um, you know what, we're going to save our energy, so to speak. Not that it's conscious, but um, it kind of feels that way sometimes. If the ones survive best that not had, that didn't just have the energy to get away, but rather it, even if half of them don't get away, the ones that do are having double the babies. Um, that's another strategy that, you know, many cichlids are using right now um, to survive. And, you know, switching up their teeth, uh, which I should do. Jeez, they're ugly. Um, Got to get them dentures when I got the cash on hand. 
Uh, all right, guys. Well, <laughs> on that note, I'm going to get out of here. We'll be announcing in its own standalone video the aquascaping contest details again and the forms and all that stuff. And then um, I also still owe a couple people gift cards that they're, they're still coming. I just haven't gotten the codes yet, Kenny being one of them. Uh, Kenny, congratulations on 2000, Danakin Aquatics. And uh, I think if I can, if I have time, depending on what my wife's doing, I am going to hop over to Dan's stream and uh, see what's going on over on Dan's fish. In his, uh, every time I go onto his channel, I feel like the music. Dun, 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 dun. Like that industrious music for like Bugs Bunny and stuff in the 1930s. Like that should be playing um, as he's like building his empire. Uh, it's like Corey, but I think even like he's a little older, so he's already kind of set in his ways. So I don't think it's changing him. I think he's just kind of like the laid back Dan guy that he's always been. He'll probably hopefully doesn't stress him out too bad, change things. But. In any case, I'm done rambling. Thank you guys for joining me. Thank you so much, Super Chatters, Lurkers, uh, members, friends, and people asking questions. If you have more questions, drop them in the comments, and then I'll get to them. I'm pretty good at that. Daily, I check a couple times a day, uh, and I hope you guys have a excellent evening or morning, wherever you are in the world. Uh, and uh, have some new videos coming out soon, and I will be back on Saturday for the next live stream. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, everything you need to know about life. If you guys go over to Dan's stream, uh, just use hashtag uh, secret history. I'd love it if you could show him some love. If y'all roll in there when we roll in, just say hashtag secret history, and then he'll know that y'all came from over there. Because I like people to know um you know that that their other people are feeling the love for him and i feel like i probably went into his time a little bit here uh and if you stuck with me thank you but uh it, it could have uh could have eaten away at some of his time let's see if someone has the link handy for it's dan's fish room uh let's see here Does someone have the link was one of my mods still in here let's see uh chubbs is still in here maybe can he get a link uh can I make some? Here, Fishy's still in here, I think. Muppet might be. I don't know. They might have all bailed. Uh, let's see. Can I get a link? No, I can't minimize this window. Urgh, I hate this program sometimes. Uh, well, we'll see if someone gets a link here in the next 30 seconds. Otherwise, um, yeah, it's Dan's Fish. Uh, Dan's Fish Room. Uh but you'll see that he's in a live stream, uh, and he's probably doing a giveaway. He usually does every week. Does a giveaway of one of his cool fish, and he's great. I mean, people ask a ton of questions in his stream, and uh, sometimes I wish our stream was a little more um, like that. Thank you so much here, Fishy. You got the link up. So, yeah, if you guys go over there, hashtag secret history. Uh, yeah, and definitely, Danikin, I don't know why you're not blue. Um, let's see here. Um boom all right you should now be a, a, a moderator brother um i don't know why that wasn't the case already all right well i'm getting off here uh and gonna go do that and i will talk to you guys later thanks for hanging out chatting rabbit trails into nowhere about things uh take it easy guys uh and have a good night thanks again bye